If we could all start gathering, please, and taking your places. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome back. I have the unenviable task of being the follower of Father John Horgan. I find that very unfair. <laughs> Father John is a very old friend of mine, and I've just always been in awe of him. I once went with him to Rome, and he would walk down the street and say, now, Saint What's-His-Face tripped on that curb and he said something that he did penance for for 24 years afterwards. And you just go, how did he know that? <laughs> he a brilliant mind. It's amazing. He has a photographic memory and he bought extra film. <laughs> That's a good one. Now today we're going to concentrate on music in the church. Um, I guess you could call this one, Make a Joyful Noise Unto the Lord. Now we know from scripture that hymns were an early and important part of the ancient church, the, the nascent church, the beginning church. In Colossians 3.16 and in Ephesians 5.14, Paul references singing hymns in Christian gatherings. And remember in that part where he's been talking about uh, what are the greatest gifts and so forth, and then he goes into how you should put your services together he didn't want everybody speaking in tongues because that's what everybody wanted to do because they could show they were better than everybody else. No. So he said, okay, now when you go come together, everything should be done in order and with beauty and have one person speak, have one person do this, have one person bring, uh, bring a hymn. So we know there are hymns there and we also have hymns that Paul quotes in his uh, writings. Uh, the most important one, uh, the most one I think that we're most familiar with, I'm using most a lot, uh, that'll be my word today. <laughs> if I could speak with the tongues of men and angels but did not have love, I would be a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. That was part of an early Christian hymn or poem. In Colossians, when he talks about Jesus take, being God, taking the form of man and not grasping, that's also part of an early Christian hymn. Now. This all makes perfect sense since the origin of the church was from the Jewish temple and synagogue, and they had singing in the temple. They used music. Uh, this was a normal part of their religious observance. And as you might note from John's gospel, at the end of the Last Supper, before they leave for the Garden of Gethsemane, they sing a hymn. They sing a song, actually, is what they say and they leave for the garden. So they would have begun the Last Supper with there's a, a very traditional hymn they would have used then, and they would have ended with a traditional hymn, and there would have been singing in between. If you ever have been to a, a Jewish festival where the family is celebrating the Passover, and they do it traditionally, there are times when you stop to sing. There are times when in, during uh, the whole of the ceremony, Poetry and music is very important. Now, uh, this coming from a Jewish tradition could explain, for instance, why don't we translate Alleluia? Because of the meter of Alleluia lends itself to music, whereas if we translated it, we'd have to go through this praise to God and so forth, which wouldn't have quite the same cadence in uh, Greek or in, even in a, from the Hebrew where Alleluia comes, which means praise to God. Um, Al is a version of El, which is the name of God, and praise unto Uliya. That's a type of worship. 
Uh, the pagan critic of the Christian movement, one of the pagan critics of the Christian movement, was a man by the name of Celsus, and he got into a dialogue with Origen, uh, and he gave backhanded praise to the Christians, whom he despised, because he was angry that their music was so beautiful. And why was it being wasted on these people who didn't really worship the right gods? Miscreants shouldn't have such beauty. Now, we have a few and very few early Greek hymns uh, surviving from uh, before the time of Constantine. The first that we know of is a very joyful hymn and possibly a paschal song to be sung during the Passover that if you read it, it sounds like it's referring to the Song of Solomon, that beautiful poem of, of love. And as it rejoices in the finding of the lost bridegroom, the verse, and we only have part of this, the versicle is, praise the Father, you holy ones, sing to the mother, you virgins. So again, they're referencing Mary. The response is, we praise, we the holy ones extol them. So they're, they're not somehow putting the mother together with the father. And the versicle then becomes, be exalted brides and bridegrooms, for you have found your bridegroom, Christ. Drink your wine, brides and bridegrooms. Obviously, he would have been welcome here. Um, but it is that, remember the Song of Solomon, at one point, the woman is bereft because she cannot find the bridegroom and she searches the town during the night and puts herself in danger to find him. And when at last she finds him in the song, her joy is enormous. That's how this song begins. Now, there's also a third century hymn, so it's somewhere in the, in the 200s, called the, now please, <laughs> the Oxyrhynchus hymn. Try to do that one quickly. The Oxyrhynchus hymn, probably from the place where it was started. It was, and it's, all we have is a scrap of it written on very badly degraded papyrus. So it was probably from Egypt, Alexandria. Um, the lyrics are written in Greek, and it has the only example of early Christian musical notation. It has a diatonic scale, which means step by step by step, and for, it goes from an F to an F, and it is the only piece, known piece of notated Christian music from the first four centuries. We only have part of it. Again, it's just a scrap, so I'll, tell you, I'll read you the parts that we have, and see if you can make some sense about putting them together with the missing pieces. Together, all the eminent ones of God. Okay, that one's okay. What they're doing together, we're not quite sure. The second verse is night, we think, or, nor the day, let it or them be silent. Let the numinous, luminous stars not something. And then in the third verse, let the rushings of the winds, the sources of all surging rivers cease, we think that's what it says, while we hymn. And then the final verse that we have is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, let all the powers answer, Amen, Amen, strength and praise. And that's all the little bit we have. It's so tantalizing. But it's amazing to see that someone actually copied down the scales for this so we would know how to sing the little bit that we have, which is quite unusual. Oh, and I, excuse me, there is a fifth verse. And glory forever to God, the sole giver of all good things, amen and amen. Left that part out, sorry about that. We have a third hymn, a little later, and this is the last of the early hymns that we have, and it's an evening hymn. Now by the time of Basil the Great in the fourth century, so in the 300s, it was in general use in all of the Eastern churches. And it is still used today in the Greek Vesper service at the lighting of the evening lamps. So 
If you ever go to an evening Vesper service, you will always hear this prayer. It's called the Fos Hilarion, or Gladsome Light. Uh, rejoicing, Hilarion can be rejoicing, it can be gladsome, it can be happy. But it reads, O light, gladsome of the holy glory of the immortal Father, the heavenly, the holy, the blessed, O Jesus Christ. Having come upon the setting of the sun, having seen the light of the evening, we praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God. Worthy it is at all times to praise thee in joyful voices, O Son of God, giver of life, for which the world glorifies thee. So it is a prayer to Jesus. Most of the hymns in the liturgy, particularly in, in the divine liturgy, the mass, are toward the Father. And in the, if you look at your Latin liturgies, how many prayers do you have that are addressed to Jesus? Nope, not during the mass. Think about it, there are, the mass is to the Father to send the Holy Spirit to bring forth Jesus, the Word in the Eucharist. But the prayer of the Mass is to, mainly to the Father. And, and even when we're calling down the Holy Spirit, it's send, O Lord, your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine that they might become for us. So we pray to the Father. The first prayer in the Mass to Jesus is the Kyrie. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, an ancient hymn that we bring forward because it's originally Greek, and we bring it into, uh, into the Mass. That's why we can say Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. It's the last little bit of Greek in the Latin tradition. The Fosilarian, like that, or like the prayer for peace, Lord Jesus Christ, who did say to your apostles, peace I leave you, it is my peace I give you, do not look upon, and so forth. That's a second hymn uh, prayer to Jesus. And so this one in, in their liturgy, the Fosilarian, is unusual, not totally unusual, because it is not the mass prayer. It is a vesper prayer. It is a night prayer. And so you call upon Jesus to be with you. Um, he is the gladsome light of the immortal Father. He is the heavenly. He is holy. He is blessed. He is Jesus Christ. And as we come to the setting of the sun, we turn our minds back to the Son of Justice. We praise the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yes, God. But it is worthy at all times to praise Thee, again to Christ, in joyful voices. O Son of God, O giver of life, for which the world glorifies you. So it acknowledges Jesus as the agent of creation, and the agent of light in the church. That's the those are the only three hymns that we have thus far. You know, there's still a lot of papyrus under the desert sands. We might find some more, but those are the only ones that we have to date. Now, in the early 200s, Clement of Alexandria became the first Christian writer to discuss what kind of music was possible for church services. Now, remember, most of the, the church is coming from the East, so they're not thinking in terms of Roman music. They're also distancing themselves from Jewish music, because in the Psalms, there's lots of reference to bringing in harps and tendrils and cymbals and banging the drums and making uh, those noises before the Lord. But Clement, was, he forbade, at least in his churches, and for the general church, he hoped, that there would be no use of musical instruments in the Christian uh, prayer services. And he declared that the music used should not be of the kind used in taverns or in theaters. Rather, it should be staid and proper. So probably one line singing at this point. Now, he would have been outraged 100 years later 
When Arius, remember Arius? Well, one of the ways that Arius got his message across was he went and got tavern songs. Everybody knew the hymns, uh, everybody knew the tune, and he put Arian theology to those tavern songs. And so the, while the baker is making bread, he's humming along with one of Arius's tunes, and uh, one of our Cappadocian fathers would go by and just go ballistic. Um, but then they took a note from uh, Arius and started writing their own words to his hymns. And because people were already using the tune, so then they began to put words that were Chalcedonian. But they didn't use those in service. They just used those as popular melodies. And this is what one of the things that Clement, 100 years earlier, was saying, don't do. Absolutely don't. Uh, but since these hymns were so popular, at least the tune was popular, they were easy to learn. It's much easier to learn a song than it is to sit down and just try to learn rote. That's why we have those doggerel little hymns um, or as we're growing up, when we grow up, you know. Oh, how to learn the uh, alphabet, for instance. Much easier with a song. Yeah, exactly. Because our minds can go to the next note. And so if you put theology to music, it's much easier. So look at the hymns that you, you really like to sing in church and get away from the music and just recite the words. And you'll sometimes find out that if you just try to recite it, what's next? Like the Anima Christi. Well, I get into it sometimes and I just cannot think of what the next stanza is. So I have to go back to the song. So love my Savior, sanctify my breast, and so forth, and try to translate that into what I'm trying to pray, or pray with the song. Now, it is surmised that antiphonal singing started somewhere in Mesopotamia and came from Mesopotamia to the West, well, to the Orthodox Church, to the Byzantine Church, uh, sometime in the second half of the fourth century. Basil the Great, for instance, had to write a letter in defense of himself uh, for introducing this innovation in music into his churches in Cappadocia because there was a, an outraged conservatism that was back with Clement of Alexandria saying we should not be doing this complicated stuff. We should instead be just singing a single line so that we can understand the words. Because that was one of the great arguments against using antiphonal singing, that you would get so much into the idea of antiphon and the idea of, of multiple voices that you would forget what the message was. But as time unfolded, as time will, the needs of the Eastern Church for music and hymns to express a growing understanding of salvation became paramount. They needed to be able to express the nature of Christ. They needed to be able to express the role of the Theotokos in the Incarnation. And a way they chose to do that was music. Liturgical music in church, in service. Because if you've ever been to a Byzantine service, almost the entire thing is sung. It is chanted. Now, the first major writer of hymns that are still in use today, as well as influencing the development of, the, of Christian church music in the East, as well as in the West, was a man by the name of Ephraim Syriacus, or Saint Ephraim the Syrian. He died around 373. Uh, in 1920, he was declared a doctor of the church. Uh, in the Eastern churches, both Catholic and Orthodox, he is given the title, the Harp of the Holy Spirit, because of the effect that his writing had on the church and the beauty of the hymns that he gave to the church. St. Jerome, uh, not really known for his um, 
calm disposition and loving response to anything that he didn't particularly like. Uh, he, however, uh, wrote about Ephraim. Ephraim, deacon of the church of Edessa, wrote many words in Syriac and became so famous that his writings are publicly read in some churches after the sacred scriptures. I have read a Greek volume of his on the Holy Spirit. I recognized the sublime genius of the man. Now, a compliment like that coming from uh, Jerome is quite amazing because there was not an argument or a fight that Jerome did not want to get involved in. I and mean, that's why he kept moving so much. <laughs> mm. No, although he had a group of women that, that followed him from Rome to Palestine and set up uh, convents there and hostels for pilgrims when they came in. So he had a great effect on the women of Rome, which is another reason that he had to leave town. Uh, <laughs> Not that there was anything sexual, but everybody was a little worried about, well, if he's got all of these rich women doing this, what's he gonna do with my wife? <laughs> I'm gonna go lock up the silver and uh, chase him out of town. Now, for our purposes, Ephraim is the most important writer because we are very large, it is very largely due to him that we owe to him the introduction of the sacred song into the liturgy of the Church of Edessa. He was the one who wrote songs for their liturgy, this would have been in the Syriac tradition, specifically to be used in liturgy. Uh, the, for instance, the Trisagion uh, was put to music by, by, by uh, Ephraim and so forth. He showed that rather than being a frivolous entertainment and helping people to forget what they were there for, hymns were instead a powerful spiritual, a powerful aid to the spirituality of the movement of prayer, as well as a means of instruction in theology. Because, again, it's much easier to hear a song and remember the message. Now from Edessa, which is in Urf, uh, now in Syria, um, this movement of singing into, mu uh, putting music into liturgy spread first to all the Eastern churches and gradually came to the West, where it would be picked up, uh, but the West tended to stay on a one-line song that eventually became attributed to Pope Gregory the Great and therefore is called Gregorian chant. It's actually a much longer period that it was developed, but uh, Gregory gets the credit in the West. But it is actually a movement coming from the East through St. Uh, Ephraim. His, his hymns covered many subjects, as did his writing. But one of, it, one of his main topics was the Holy Spirit, but equally was the Theotokos and her role, role in the incarnation of the Word. Now, I'm going to give you an example of one of the six hymns called Songs of Praise. Uh, and Ephraim uh, wrote this one about, as a hymn on the Nativity. Awake, my harp, your songs in praise of the Virgin Mary. Lift up your voice and sing the wonderful history of the Virgin, the daughter of David, who gave birth to the life of the world. So here he's referencing again Mary giving birth, the Virgin giving birth. Who loves you is amazed, and who would understand is silent and confused. So if you love her, wonder. But if you try to figure it out, you're in trouble. Because he cannot probe the mother who gave birth in her virginity. If it is too great to be clarified with words, remember what Father John said about St. Bonaventure and uh, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, 
they weren't able to put it into words. If it is too great to be clarified with words, the disputants ought not on that account cross swords with your son. So just because you can't understand it and explain it, don't let it put you off of Christ. In the womb, in the womb of Mary, the infant was formed who from eternity is equal to the father. So there he's knocking out the whole Arian controversy and the, the controversy of Chalcedon with Nestorius. He imparted to us his greatness and took on our infirmity. So here's this Pauline theology. He became mortal like us and joined his life to ours, joined his life to ours so that we might die no more. The purpose of the incarnation. The virgin became a mother while preserving her virginity. And though still a virgin, she carried a child in her womb and the handmaid and work of his wisdom became the mother of God. It's a lovely hymn, and uh, there are many versions of it still being sung today. If you uh, go through the catalog of uh, Cantoris and Ecclesiae, they uh, do this hymn multiple times with different settings because it's the kind of hymn that many different composers would put this to music. Any questions thus far? Oh, good, okay. Now, this is uh, Ephraim, and he's coming around a long time ago. But there was another hymn that is equally beloved by the Orthodox Church. Um, remember when I was showing you the icon of uh, Our Lady of Protection, where she's holding her veil out? And in the, the large one at the bottom, I told you there were all these figures, one of whom standing in the center was Romanus the Melodist. He was the one who wrote so many famous hymns. And he, in fact, had been influenced by Ephraim's. He gives credit to Ephraim. Now, Romanus died sometime after 555. Uh, he was originally a converted Jew who came to Constantinople from Syria so he had that Syrian background where music began and wrote hymns for Justinian's foundations in Constantinople, Justinian the Great. He was a great builder. He's the one who built the Hagia Sophia in the form we know it. He um, created a form of music called the Kantakian. And a Kantakian is a, a sermon of, it's, it's a sermon in music where the stanza is chanted from the altar and then the choir takes the versicle back. So you've got a single voice, you've got a, a, a cantor, a soloist, and then you have a choir response. He's the one who invented that for Constantinople. he is thought to have influenced the writer of this hymn, the Akathist hymn, which is one of the most important and beloved hymns to Mary in the Orthodox tradition. It is used every great Lent, and the great Lent is what we would call, what we would call Lent, um, every day, they would use this hymn in their Vesper service or in their prayer service. Um, partly inspired by Romanus, we don't exactly know who was the author of the uh, Akathistos hymn, but it, it recounts the whole of the story of salvation uh, of the incarnation. And I'm gonna need my glasses over there here. <laughs> Oh, uh, the eternal search. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So here's how it opens, and I'm not going to do the whole thing because that is uh, 12 pages long. <laughs> it's a long service, it's Lent. <laughs> Having secretly received the command, the archangel hastened to Joseph's abode and spoke to the Holy Virgin. He who bowed the heavens with his descending is wholly contained yet unchanged in you. And seeing him the, uh, taking the likeness of a servant in your womb, I stand in amazement and cry out unto you, Rejoice, O unwedded bride. So it's moving the hymn coming from God, the angel coming down to the house of Joseph, where Mary is moved in, and sees an amazing thing. And this refrain of the unwedded bride is used over and over and over again throughout uh, the liturgy. The first contachion, after that introduction of incarnation, unto you, O Theotokos, invincible champion, your city, or we your people is an alternate reading, in thanksgiving ascribes the victory for the deliverance from sufferings. And having your might unassailable, free us from all dangers so that we may cry unto you, Rejoice, O unwedded bride. So what is the Kentuckian about? Unto you, O Theotokos, invincible champion, your city in thanksgiving ascribes the victory for the deliverance from sufferings. So to Mary, we're ascribing the victory for the deliverance from sufferings. And having your might unassailable, so no one could oppose you, free us from all dangers. So what is he calling Mary? No? Well, he did that. But this particular stanza is about her being mediatrix of graces. It's an early beginning of that theology in the Eastern Church, which was much more involved in it throughout the centuries, and the West is now beginning to pick it up again. So that is about mediatrix. So the first part was incarnation, now we're into the mediatrix, and then the response to that is called an echos. This is number one of many. The archangel was sent from heaven to cry rejoice to the Theotokos, and beholding you, O Lord, taking bodily form, he stood in awe, and with his bodiless voice he cried aloud to her such things as these. Rejoice, you through whom joy shall shine forth. Rejoice, you through whom the curse will vanish. Rejoice, the restoration of fallen Adam. Rejoice, the redemption of the tears of Eve. Rejoice, O height above human logic. Rejoice, O depth invisible, even to the eyes of angels. Rejoice, for you are the king's throne. Rejoice, you who bear him, who bears the universe. Rejoice, O star revealing the sun. Rejoice, O womb of divine incarnation. Rejoice, you through whom creation is renewed. Rejoice, you through whom the Creator is born a babe. Rejoice, O unwedded bride. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> Rejoice, you through whom joy shall shine forth. He's giving Mary, the angel, the archangel, is giving Mary these things and others that she is able to do and to be, and therefore we rejoice with her rejoicing. Because, we, as he says, rejoice to the Theotokos, so she is called Theotokos there. But that is not primarily what this uh, stanza is about. It is about our salvation, in which Mary is a prime participant. Mary becomes the second Eve and heals the fallen Adam and Eve. 
She redeems the tears of Eve. She, redeer, uh, she restores fallen Adam. And she is the height above human logic because how is it possible that someone human could be able to do all of this, to be able to be uh, a participant in our salvation because salvation only comes from God. But Mary goes through God and therefore through her we receive the Christ and through her then by that same analogy we receive salvation. So she is the height beyond our logic. There's no way we can understand how this can possibly happen. And a depth invisible even to the eyes of angels. So her, the mystery of Mary, this, this wondrous sacramental idea of Mary's life is so deep even the angels stand in awe because they cannot comprehend it. So how can we? Rejoice for you are the king's throne. Rejoice because you are where the king reigns from. And that's the purpose of all these icons, that Mary bears the son. Rejoice you who bear him, who bore the universe. So how could he who is uncontainable be contained in your womb? You, the star, reveal the sun. So uh, usually it's Mary is compared to the moon reflecting the sun's rays. But in this case, he makes her have her own light, separate from the sun's light. O womb of divine incarnation, you through whom creation is renewed, rejoice because through you the Savior was born. Then in the second Kantakian, and again, this is what would be chanted from the Bema, from the altar. Beholding herself in purity, the Holy One courageously said to Gabriel, your strange voice seems almost unbelievable to my soul. For how do you speak of birth giving without seed? And she cried aloud, Alleluia. Her response, as Sister Therese said yesterday, to all of this amazement, this news that she was to be the mother of God, her response is praise. It's not a, oh, I'm so good, or yay for me, but alleluia is praise to God. Praise to God. She doesn't understand it, but praise to God. And then the response from the choir, seeking to know the incomprehensible knowledge Remember, this is all in Greek, so you don't have to worry about how would they sing this. Seeking to know the incomprehensible knowledge, the virgin cried out to him who ministered to her, how may a son be born from a virginal womb? Tell me. So here's that questioning of Mary. How's this going to happen? I mean, this is amazing. How are you going to do it? Is basically what she's saying. To her he answered in fear, yet crying thus. Now the fear here is not terror, the fear here is that awe of God. Cries thus, rejoice, O seer of the ineffable will. Rejoice, O surety of those praying in silence. Rejoice, you the preface of Christ's miracles. You the preface of Christ's miracles. Rejoice, you the pinnacle of his commandments. Rejoice, O heavenly ladder by which God descended. Rejoice, O bridge leading those from earth to heaven. Rejoice, O miracle much marveled of angels. Rejoice, O trauma much dirged of demons. Rejoice, you who ineffably gave birth to the light. Rejoice, you who revealed the mystery to none. Rejoice, O knowledge superseding the wise. Rejoice, you who enlighten the minds of the faithful. Rejoice, O unwedded bride. So what does that response tell you? What are they, they're responding to Mary hearing that she is to be mother and she is questioning 
How? So what is the response saying? It starts with seeking to know the incomprehensible. The virgin cried out to the one who ministered to her, to Gabriel, how may a son be born from a virgin womb? Tell me. And then he says, O seer of the ineffable word. What's a seer? Pardon? Someone who looks for something? A prophet. It is someone who has a vision and they tell out that vision. So not really a prophet, but similar because the, the Greeks had many seers like the Delphi Oracle and so forth, being an oracle basically. O seer of the ineffable word, in other words, she's telling the world by her pregnancy and by her response to God's request about the word of God. Rejoice you the preface of Christ's miracles. And this is the important uh, center of this particular Kentuckian. Another Kentucky in the Icos. She is the preface of Christ's miracles. In other words, Christ is not even born yet. Yet Mary has already received the grace of salvation. The grace of the cross has already come to her long before the actions of Jesus in his life and death and resurrection. So she is the first to receive the results of salvation. So that makes her the preface. So what, how is she prefaced? What is the prefacing? What is he trying to say about Mary? The hint is immaculate conception. <laughs> that from the beginning of time, it was known, Mary was known, and from the beginning of time, Mary was saved. Mary was, pardon? Salvation takes away original sin. And Mary never had original sin. So that was the preface. the preface. So she never had original sin, mm -hmm. therefore she's immaculate. Right, right. exactly. So Mary is immaculate, she, uh, so that was make her, makes her the preface, the first to receive the fruits of the coming of her son. And then, through her receiving those fruits, then she passes those blessings on to us. So it's, and you'll find this throughout Ephraim, he's one of the first to really talk about and the one to encourage the belief in the Immaculate Conception. They wouldn't have called it that back then. That's a much later term as we unfold the mystery of Christ. But he does talk about her being immaculately conceived. Okay. Kentuckian three. You were hoping that was the last, right? <laughs> the power of the Most High then overshadowed the Virgin that she might conceive, and her fruitful womb he made a, fer a fertile meadow for those desiring to reap salvation as they chant, Alleluia. So again, the people are moving away from the unwedded bride, crying out Alleluia as well, because we see salvation then coming toward us through this fruitful womb made a fertile meadow for all those desiring to reap salvation. So using this imagery, her fruitful womb becomes, a what's a meadow? What can you do in a meadow? Grow things. So it's her, her fruitful room, womb that not only brings forth the Christ, but it also brings forth a place for our salvation to grow. And that's why they cheer seeing their salvation coming and cry out, Alleluia. The response to that, carrying, Christ, uh, carrying God in her womb, the virgin hastened to Elizabeth, whose unborn babe, forthwith recognizing Mary's salutation, rejoiced, and with leaps as it were with songs, he cried out to the Theotokos, rejoice, O branch of the unwithering vine, rejoice, 
O land yielding the untainted fruit. Rejoice, O husbandry of the merciful husbandman. Rejoice, O breath giver to the planter of our life. Rejoice for a field of uh, bearing abundant compassion. Rejoice, O table laden with an abundance of mercies. Rejoice, for you make the meadow produce contentment. Rejoice, for you prepare a haven for souls. Rejoice, acceptable incense of intercession. Rejoice, oblation for all the world. Rejoice, favor of God to mortals. Rejoice, access of mortals to God. Rejoice, O unwedded bride. As she hastens to Elizabeth, John the Baptist hears the sound of the greeting to his mother and leaps in joy. It in some Orthodox thinking, as in some Western thinking now, uh, that is the moment when John is then cleansed of original sin. When he encounters the word in the womb of his mother. So already salvation is beginning to be spread through the use of the Virgin Mary. And again, he uses a, is still using a lot of these images of farming. Branch of the unwithering vine. Who's the unwithering vine? God. And she is the branch of that salvation that the, brine, brand, the vine will bring. And with leaps and joy, he cried out to the, to the Theotokos, O branch of the unwithering vine, O land yielding the untainted fruit. So she is then become the new Garden of Eden because the old garden was tainted by sin. Through Mary, the taint is removed. The garden is now available for salvation. Rejoice, O husbandry of the merciful husbandman. The husbandman, of course, is God, the farmer. And God is the one who is spreading his grace. And Mary is the husbandry. So what's he saying then? He's saying that she then is the whole, not just one small piece of, but the whole of the salvation event unfolding. So through her, all of us will receive the fruits of God's working in his field, that new Eden that Mary has become, but she's also the working out of the salvation, the husbandry. Rejoice, O birth giver, to the planter of our life. All you gardeners should be just really sitting up here. <laughs> birth giver to the planter of our life, Jesus, who brings back salvation lost by sin brings back that connection with God that we lost. Rejoice, O field bearing abundant compassion. So one, this is going to be one of the mercies that Mary brings by her work as mother of God. She is a field, and from that field, the new, the new Eden, will come the fruits of compassion, of the merciful love of God passing through her work. Rejoice, O table laden with the abundance of mercies. So now we've moved from the field into the celebration, and we approach the table, and the inference is it is the table of the altar. Rejoice, for you make the meadow produce contentment. You're bringing down all of the strife coming from sin, and rejoice, for you prepare a haven for souls. And again, he's saying Mary is doing this work. You're preparing, by the way you are living your life, by the way you're receiving God, by the way that you are responding 
to God's request and by the way that you are bringing to fruit the salvation in your womb, you are preparing a place for souls in Jesus. So he's giving Mary lots of power because she is the acceptable incense of intercession. You know that as the evening incense rises, so our prayers rise to thee. Incense was always seen as a symbol of prayer rising to God. It's the reason we use it in the church. So her, she's acceptable incense because it's not being offered to pagan gods. It's being offered to the true God and it is the incense of our prayer, our intercession, our hopes. Rejoice, oblation for all the world. She is also being called a sacrifice. She is also being called that which is given, the oblation to God. So she is the oblation for all the world because she says, yes, we are saved. Rejoice, favor of God to mortals. She is God's gift to us. Rejoice, access of mortals to God. So it's going the other way as well. Through her, the favor of God comes to mortals. Through her, our access to God becomes alive. Rejoice, O unwedded bride. Now the next Kentuckian, how close am I coming? Five minutes? Okay. The next one is, well, the, the two next ones are really what I want to get into. The first one is Joseph. So, and there's not a lot at this point in the church's history for Joseph. He's almost never on the icons unless he's with the, the nativity. There's, there are no just simple icons of Joseph. His cult in the East had not yet taken off. Having th doubtful thoughts, the righteous Joseph was troubled. This is the Kentuckian from the altar. Having doubtful thoughts, the righteous Joseph was troubled, for he suspected a secret union as he beheld you unwed, O blameless one. But when he learned of your conception through the Holy Spirit, the angel comes and tells of Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary into your house, for that which she has conceived has been by the Holy Spirit. He cried out, Alleluia, because his doubts are being answered. And he can then love Mary as not being defiled. And the response to that from the choir is, on hearing the angels praising the incarnate presence of Christ, the shepherds hastened as to, uh, as to a shepherd, and beholding him as a spotless lamb, pastured in Mary's womb. Her they hymned and said, Rejoice, mother of the lamb and shepherd. Rejoice, fold of the rational sheep. Rejoice, O defense against invisible foes. Rejoice, opener of the gates of paradise. Rejoice, for the things of heaven rejoice with the earth. Rejoice, the things of the earth join chorus with the heavens. Rejoice, never silent voice of the apostles. Rejoice, never conquered courage of the martyrs. Rejoice, firm support of the faith. Rejoice, shining token of grace. Rejoice, you through whom Hades was laid bare. Rejoice, you through whom we are clothed with glory. Rejoice, O unwedded bride. What's odd about that? What was the Kentuckian? What was that verse from the altar? It was Joseph and his doubts. So we expect the next part is going to deal with Joseph and his doubts. It doesn't mention them. That's taken care of. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. And it goes right into the shepherds. And that whole dialogue of, of Christ being both shepherd and sheep, which is in honor of the, sh uh, the shepherds who come. The next Kentuckian, a Kentuckian five, is about the Magi. And this is the last one I'll put you through. <laughs> Beholding the Godward pointing star, the Magi followed its radiance, and holding it as a lantern, they sought through it the mighty king. And having approached the unreachable, they rejoiced and cried to him, Alleluia. So here again, we have the Magi. They use the star as a lantern. It's that whole idea of they traveled to find something that was not available, not reachable. God, in his majesty, they traveled and they found him. 
and the, uh, the Icos for that, the response to that, the sons of the Chaldees saw in the hands of the virgin him who by his hand fashioned man. And sensing him as Lord, even though he had taken the form of a servant, very Pauline, they hasted with gifts to do homage. And they cried out to her who is blessed, rejoice, mother of the never setting star, rejoice, dawn of the mystic day, rejoice, you who have conquered the fiery furnace of error, rejoice, you who have enlightened the initiates of the Trinity, rejoice, you who have remo removed the inhuman tyrant from power. Rejoice, you who have shown Christ the man befriending Lord. Rejoice, you who have redeemed us from the pagan religion. Rejoice, you who have res rescued us from the works of mire, sin. Rejoice, you who have ceased the worship of fire. Rejoice, you who saves us from the flames of passion. Rejoice, guide of the faithful to chastity. Rejoice, O delight of all generations. Rejoice, O unwedded bride. Unlike with Joseph, they stick with the Magi. Joseph has been taken care of, but the Magi have their time. Now, Joseph is gonna come up later in, the, uh, in this Kentuckian, but he is, he, he's there. The Magi, however, have their bit and they get to say their bit. Joseph will be shown later doing the things that he needs to, the flight into Egypt and so forth. So he's much more of an active. Uh, but here you have the Magi crying out to the one who is blessed, doing him homage. Uh, Rejoice, mother of the never setting star. It's a star they followed, but they lost that star. Now they've got a star that they're never gonna lose. It's never gonna set. It's always going to be leading them on. So, and they're rejo rejoicing in the dawn of the mystic day. So there is a new day rising, and the dawn of that day is Mary, who gives birth to the day. Rejoice, you have quenched the fiery furnace of error. This is an allusion to the Old Testament when the, uh, the three boys, uh, three young men, were thrown into the uh, fiery furnace. But for this, the fiery furnace is error. And so Mary is bringing truth to the world and enlightening the initiates of the Trinity. And you who have removed the inhuman tyrant from power, who's the inhuman tyrant? The devil. So all of evil. Rejoice, you who have shown Christ, the man befriend, befriending Lord. What a wonderful thing to be able to say. So it's a hymn, and it goes on like that for quite a long time. It's a quite a long service, but it's a beautiful service, especially if you get, get a good choir doing it. Um, but you can also go to the uh, Cantoris and Ecclesiae and get one of their CDs, and somewhere on there is gonna be some part of the Akathist hymn, because it's, one, it's still one of the favorite hymns of the Orthodox tradition. Now it is time for us just about, you got one question, I think, anybody? No, uh, Ephraim, he was a, a, an influence on Romanus, who was an influence on the person who wrote this hymn. We don't know who wrote this hymn. Okay. Yeah, it is anonymous. But we can see a lot of what we know about the hymn, hymnology or hymnody of uh, Romanus. We can see a lot of that in this, uh, in this Akathis hymn. I always keep mispronouncing it, sorry about that. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you again tomorrow. God bless. Thank you.